corruption affects the enjoyment of rights and weaken democratic institutions, both in new and long-established democracies. When corruption is prevalent, those in public positions fail to take decisions with the interest of society in mind. As a result, corruption damages the legitimacy of a democratic regime in the eyes of the public and leads to a loss of public support for democratic institutions. In countries where corruption is pervasive in the rule of law system, both the implementation of existing legal frameworks and the efforts to reform them are impeded. My name is Hannah Gerdes. I am a Swedish human rights lawyer and the founder of Hannah and Goliath Law and Education. And it's a great honor for me today to moderate this panel on anti-corruption and human rights. I would like to warmly welcome all of you joining us here today, as well as all of you watching uh, the live broadcast from this panel. And today we have with us some very knowledgeable people to discuss this subject, and I would like to introduce them. Um, Times Magazine has named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She has been awarded the Integrity Award by Transparency International and named African Person of the Year by Forbes Magazine. She was part of drafting the final constitution of South Africa, and between 2009 and 2016, she served as the public protector of South Africa. She became known for her courage worldwide when she held the president accountable for wasting public funds on his private estate. Please give a warm applause and welcome Tuli Mandoncella. <laughs> To deepen our understanding of anti-corruption work as a key element of protecting human rights, we also have with us the director of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute, Morten Karam. Morten has a very impressive CV, but I would like to start off, I've presented you before, so I would actually like to pre uh, start off by presenting him with the most important thing, and it is that Morten is a true human rights activist. He has spent his whole career working for the implementation of human rights. Morten has been the director of the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, and Morten has recently, uh, you were recently appointed by the UN General Secretary as a new board member of two core UN human rights funds. Morten is the chair of the board of the European Council on Refugees uh, and Excise, and he was the founding director of the Danish Institute for Human Rights. So I think we should give you also a warm applause for joining us here. <laughs> And one important part of fighting corruption is, of course, political parties. We are also, therefore, very happy to have Martin Engeby with us today, the Secretary General of the Swedish International Liberal Center. Silk is a nonprofit foundation linked to the Liberal Party of Sweden. And Martin has previously worked at the International Institute for Democracy and International Assistance. Martin is the chairman of the Vil Vilnius-based International Election Study Center, and you are also the former coordinator of the European Network for Political Foundations. So also give a please a warm applause for Martin. So um, I would actually like to start off by giving you, Tuli, um, a, a little longer time and chance to tell us a bit more about your work, because you are acknowledged worldwide for your countless efforts of fighting corruption and building a strong human rights protection in South Africa. So could you please tell us more about your work and how you as a lawyer came into working with anti-corruption? Thank you, Hannah. Greetings to all colleagues and thank you for the privilege to be here. My work into corruption started 
as, um, as an extension of my work on human rights and justice. From as young as about 16 or so, I was involved in the struggle. And once I qualified as a lawyer, my focus was on issues of social justice, which would be equality, primarily on the basis of race, gender, disability, and issues of HIV and AIDS. Later, I extended to cover all issues around equality. When I worked as the full-time commissioner in the Department of Justice, one of the issues that kept emerging was the the, the impact of corruption on law reform and the impact of corruption on policy choices. Most of the times when we think about corruption, we're thinking about grand corruption, when somebody maybe issues a state contract or a company contract for, for, the, for the reward of a bribe. But there are insipid areas of corruption that happen every day. And the ones that I've come across in my career as public protector and law reform specialist are the areas of corruption that are about distortions in policy priorities, distortions in government expenditure, and ultimately wastage in government expenditure. The public protector is like the Swedish ombudsman. In fact, we copied the idea from Sweden. I think the rest of the world copied it from Sweden. Sweden invented it, I think, more than 200 years ago. What has happened, though, over the years is that as countries copy the Swedish ombudsman model, they add to it. So you would consider the public protector as the Swedish ombudsman on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, what is added? What, what in South Africa was added to the ombudsman was a mandate that includes fighting corruption. So ordinarily, that would be given to a separate anti-corruption commission. The second mandate that was given to the public protector that would not normally go to an ombudsman was the mandate to oversee uh, integrity in parliament and the executive. So usually that would be given to an integrity commission or an ethics commission. In, in South Africa, the, um, the enforcement of the executive ethics code and, and, and related matters was given to the public. But another difference with the Swedish Ombudsman is the power to make enforceable decisions. Traditionally, an Ombudsman makes recommendations, investigates, reports, and makes recommendations. The, the South African Constitution gives the public protector the power to decide what should happen. If she or he decides that they want to recommend or to suggest what government should do, that's allowed in the Constitution. But if she chooses to direct government to act, then she, she does so. And in, in my case, th this power was contested, the power to, to direct government to do what it needed to do. As I've indicated, the Constitution gives the institution three powers. The power to investigate any conduct in state affairs that is regarded as uh, improper and to report on that conduct and take appropriate remedial action. Whenever I made decisions around maladministration. So a, a, a grandmother was treated badly, her license was not given on time, her uh, RTP house or social house was not given on time, or her electricity was switched off wrongfully without a proper due process regarding uh, administrative justice. When I made findings that government was wrong and asked government to fix the problem, the problem would be fixed immediately. There were no problems. I remember one of the difficult cases that I did was a soldier who wasn't paid on time, and because of that, um, she lo he lost his house, and I said the Department of Defense must pay, must, must give him another house. Even that difficult case, the government implemented. But when it comes to corruption, that's where the problem came. It, it, by 
2014, some people in government started saying, no, but you are an ombudsman. Uh, we shouldn't necessarily implement your decisions. And in, in the process, uh, the matter resulted in a court case. Uh, one of the parties, the economic freedom, freedom fighters, took the matter to court about the implementation of the decision. And that related to the case involving the renovations at the president's house. Because the Schnell Court found that indeed the constitution gives the public protector the right to make binding decisions. And how, how is this important insofar as human rights are concerned? I would just say that I want to agree with you, Hannah, that as a public protector I found that, apart from the fact that corruption distorts public policy, it also erodes public trust to the extent that even when there's no corruption, you lose public trust. Mm -hmm. Some of the cases I've dealt with, I, I, I made an example this morning about a, a community that closed schools for a whole year because they thought money had been stolen. But because of the prevalence of corruption, they thought in this case uh, money had been stolen, whereas no, money had not been stolen, it had not been allocated. I could proceed and just say that um, the last case that I dealt with is a case called state capture, and it really is about allegations that the state is no longer operating, or elements of the state are no longer operating democratically because they are under the grip of the president's family and a, a, a certain uh, business family. The allegation is that that involves the appointment of ministers and appointment of, minister of, of some of the board members of state-owned enterprises. How does that affect an ordinary person in terms of their human rights? It affects social and economic rights because monies uh, that are supposed to pay for water, electricity, housing, roads, hospitals, etc., are often used for tenders that shouldn't have issued to start with, or even if they have been issued, there's overpayment, overbilling, and overcharging. But secondly, the right to equality is eroded. And in a proper democracy, you would like to believe that there'll be fair competition, and that if you work hard, you will be given your due. But in a corrupt situation, you find that people who are hard workers end up being frustrated and at the end of the day, they may even give up hmm. because they think, what's the point of working hard if the opportunity is gonna go to someone who is connected? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tuli, uh, for giving us some background. Um, could I ask you, what was uh, the biggest challenges for you working as a public protector? What, what, would you, what did you find most challenging? Political, the politics of oversight was the biggest challenge. Normally, when you oversee people, it helps to have the big guy or the big woman uh, behind you. And um, we just spoke with Martin and, and remembered that I work with Dala Omo and uh, the Danish uh, Human Rights Institute was helping us to transform the justice system. So it helps to have a person like him who has integrity and supports you. And what eventually happened to me was that some of the decisions I made, when there's a political fallout, when there's a political fallout amongst the politicians, and I make a decision against somebody who's no longer in the inner circle, the implementation would be swift, and the insults would be minimum. If you make a decision, though, that affects somebody who is extremely powerful, then there will be a backlash. In my case, there were death threats. There were uh, allegations that I was a spy, but three separate allegations. The one was saying I'm CIA, um, uh, British, British MI6, and Israeli Mossad, all in one case. And um, 
And then the last one, when I was doing this last investigation on state capture, it was said that I was an agent of white monopoly capital and that I had been paid to do this. And, and it so happened that I was appointed as a professor of law uh, at the beginning of this year, but I deferred taking that position until 2019. Uh, the trolls on Twitter that whose friends were affected by the investigation were saying that that's a job that I'm being given um, as a reward by white monopoly capital for saving them wealth. So basically the backlash, the politics of oversight of the sins of the powerful gets in the way and you need to, to have an elephant skin and a strong team to be able to continue. So there is a big also um, a personal cost you also pay when you actually uh, look at the highest power. Are we going to get back to this? I mean, the role of politics of actually what can politics do uh, also to within themselves, etc. Um, I would like to ask more to one thing because you worked so long with human rights, and um, I mean, is anti-corruption a core human rights issue? I mean, what do you think about that? And in what way does it actually impeach human rights? Um, and what can human rights bring to this fight against corruption? Thank you. I, I think Julie put it so, so brilliantly. So, uh, but, so I can only add elements, I think. But, uh, but definitely, if I should point to one single feature, uh, the single most important feature eroding human rights and democratic institutions today in the world, then it would be corruption. We run into it constantly as a lit. You can move ever so far, and then you get to where the corruption is sort of the barrier for the next steps. And, and, and if you don't, so if you don't address that, then, I mean, we cannot move the human rights agenda or deepen our democratic uh, societies. So, I mean, as a feature there, it's, uh, I mean, dom very dominant. And as uh, Tuli said, I mean, it's uh, the access to health. I mean, that funding is diverted from the health system, so you simply don't get, or you have to pay the doctor, bribe the doctor, or pay the doctor. Uh, second, the, the, in the school system, again, funds diverted, so the quality of the education, if at all present, uh, is very low and you have to bribe the teachers for your grades, for your exams, for your et cetera. And it's all the way up from the early school years up to the highest uh, educations. Public services, you talked about yeah. water, uh, sewage, uh, housing uh, permission, building permissions. So it's sort of uh, the right to housing. So it sort of points, it hits so many different, uh, or I would say the whole, all the, with the whole package, I would say, of human rights, not to talk about fair t trial. I mean, how can you enter a courtroom if you're not quite certain whether the judge or the judges are actually bribed or not? Would you get a fair trial? So it touches on so many uh, elements. So that's sort of the impediment of, of human rights. But then there's also another dimension to this where you could say it directly threatens your right to life. Let me just give you one example some of you may remember we had, uh, what is it, less than a year ago, uh, an earthquake in uh, Italy. And where you had like uh, something like, I think more than 200 people died in that uh, earthquake in, in central uh, Italy. And when they looked into it, all these constructions that collapsed during the earthquake had a few years before when there was a recognition, there was another earthquake and there was a very stronger recognition of the danger in that particular area. They had received enormous funds to reconstruct the buildings, the church tower, the schools, etc., etc. And after this new earthquake where one family died because the, uh, the tower of the uh, church fell into the house and sort of killed the entire uh, family, and all these institutions and, and uh, buildings had received funding to exactly strengthen uh, the construction to be earthquake uh, proof so they could actually resist the, the earthquake.
earthquake. But all the funding had disappeared into other pockets uh, and uh, the corruption had simply hindered that, mm -hmm. that reconstruction. So if you take a country like Turkey and uh, the US, California, they have almost similar legislation when it comes to earthquakes. Where in Turkey, when you have, now I mentioned Italy, now I return to Turkey, when there are uh, earthquakes there, there are many more deaths than the, you have in, in California, where you have tighter or less corruption than you have in a country like uh, Turkey. So, I mean, it has that direct bearing uh, on the protection of, uh, of citizens. Finally, you asked me, what can uh, human rights bring to it? I think when I look across the world today, uh, when I speak with people in, I would almost say, on all continents, there is still this sort of normality around corruption. People perceive it as normal that you pay the doctor, you pay the teacher, you etc. That it's sort of, uh, I wouldn't say it's accepted, but it's, it's, there's a certain normality. And we have to change that. And I think one of the ways is that we have addressed corruption in the criminal law room, prosecution, etc. And that's, of course, where it should be as well. But in the human rights world, we have been strangely absent. And I think what we can add, we can add, sort of say, an understanding of why is this so grave? How is it that, it, as I explained, how it erodes people's human rights? And I think if we can sort of say, channel that frustration about uh, uh, corruption, into also understanding the, wi the wider impact. I would basically say to stigmatize, starting by stigmatizing the corrupt people. Because, I mean, across the world, we know that that person is working in the municipality. We know the level of salary in the municipality. And yet he has two big red Ferraris in his garage. It simply doesn't match up. And, and they are still parked outside the house because it's still not sufficiently stigmatizing to be corrupt. So my modest aim is at least that he builds a garage and hide those cars. <laughs> uh, but luckily, I mean, hopefully we can move further than that. But we need to have that change in mentality and, and perception of corruption before I think we can move on. Because otherwise, it will be an endless battle. It may anyway be an endless battle, but, but I think it, we are bound to lose the fight against corruption if we don't get a bottom-up uh, approach to it and understanding. So basically, the stigmatizing, the understanding what it does to a society. This is very interesting because we're talking about different levels here. Uh, uh, first yeah. of all, I read and I, I hope it's correct that uh, j just uh, recently, like last month, the Supreme Court in South Africa decided that the president, uh, it will, they will now look at the charges. Uh, so on one hand, you need to have a, a faith in the court system that now that the, actually the Supreme Court will look at this and that it will actually be, be a fair trial, but also on the individual level. And you're talking about how it's uh, normal in society, it made me think of uh, when I traveled in Poland, I'm half Polish, and um, I just, I had a ticket and then the person in the train told me one stop before mine, your ticket ends here. And I said, I'm not sure, it says one more station. He said, no, you have to go off here. And he told me to go off. And then my friend that was Polish, she said, don't worry, Hannah, I'll fix this. And she went out and she took out money from her pocket and she paid mm -hmm. and there was no problem to go. And I was like totally in shock. And I said, what, you, what did you do? And she said, this is how it works. We d there's nothing we can do about it. So as you say, if we even accept this and this every day as individuals, what happens then? What kind of society do we create? And it was really scary that she also was brought up with the idea that this is the way it has to be done, otherwise we won't be able to travel, right? This was many years ago, but still. So, on the, both on the like really structural level and on the individual level. Um, I want to ask one more thing before uh, I turn to the idea of the responsibility of politics, and it's actually, um, because I think that it's often seen as an individual problem. Like you see a politician and you think, oh, that politician was corrupt, right? Or you think this person, that, that leader of this big business, he was corrupt. But is it really an individual problem rather than a structural one? And how can we work against this? How should we look at this? Is it a structural problem, an individual problem? Would you like to reflect on that, Tuli? Perhaps you as well, yeah? 
Thank you, Hannah. I think, yes, one of our mistakes is to treat corruption as an individual problem. And uh, in South Africa, you would know that as soon as I had finalized the investigation on state capture, well, which wasn't quite final, but there was a report titled the State of Capture, and I had asked for a commission of inquiry to be established because I had seen that there's a systemic problem and you need a huge commission of inquiry to look at the, the entire system. People instead, they went for the president and, and asked the president to resign and they had a hashtag, Zuma must fall. Mm -hmm. And one year down the line, the problem continues. The commission of inquiry has not taken place. And um, we had yesterday in an ESCOM inquiry that the corruption has continued. And that was the mistake. Had, had, we, had society realized that we really need to have the inquiry, we really need to look at um, all of the tentacles of the snake and, and deal with it as such. And it, if we're dealing with it also as a system, we've got to understand that corruption is not a government problem because often it's seen as, as an individual problem and as a, a problem of politicians without looking at the fact that we get corrupt government officials from a corrupt system in society. And, and we need to then get back to that system and look at our ethics and look at who do we place in power and what do we do when people do wrong? Do we punish some and ignore some or do we punish everyone? So uh, I would like to ask you, Martin, <laughs> yes. uh, because you are the head of a liberal foundation and you're working to strengthen democracy globally. Uh, is corruption a big threat towards democracy? And how do you work with this? Have you seen in your work mm -hmm. any examples of how corruption impedes human rights? Yeah, I, I think the, I, the corruption is not a threat to democracy. Democracy is a threat to corruption. I think the normal state of being and where we're coming from is, is a society where you do favors, where there are no rules, where the strong man has rights over the person with less resources. So anything to fight corruption is actually building good governance. And this is a challenge. A challenge is not to fight corruption because that, that's, that's a normal state. The challenge is really to build, build the strong, strong institutions. And, and therefore, we have to build, uh, build democracy. And uh, Silk is a, is a foundation that works with, the, with political parties. Uh, when we, uh, as Sweden and Swedish foreign policy and, and as aid givers, try to promote democracy in, in other countries, we focus a lot on building a lot of institutions. Uh, we build the, the Ombudsman Office. I'm sure that you have received support at some point from, uh, from the Swedish Development Aid. Uh, we, build, uh, we build the Statistics Office, we build courts, we build all, all sorts of things. But there is little investment in political parties, but actually in Sweden we do uh, support a little bit of political parties. Every party in the Swedish parliament gets a grant uh, commensurate with its own size to try to develop uh, democratic parties in other countries. Uh, and then, of course, the corruption, you can, we were talking about this is a problem of, of the individuals, etc. Corruption is a, a very useful metaphor is that the, the fish rots from the head back. If, if, if it's rotten at the top, if there is not a will to build democratic institutions, then of course the, it will fail at the top and it will fail at, at, at all other levels. So that's why we have to try to bring non-corrupt people, non-corrupt uh, movements uh, into, uh, in, into the, the government offices. And as civil society organizations, many of, of, of you are here, uh, you are standing on the sidelines. Um, when we, we talk about building a, you know, a fair political system, we are investing in ombudsmen, we are investing in human rights defenders, monitors, etc. Uh, so it, I am not a fan of sports at all, so I'm not a fan of sports m metaphors really, but uh, this one is kind of useful. You, you build a stadium, uh, you train the supporter clubs, uh, you train the referees, uh, the, the massaging team, uh, the media uh, that is going to look at the game, but you don't do, you don't train the games, uh, the, the, the teams at all, and and then you will not have a, have a fair 
you will not have a fair and, and, and good game on, on the pitch. And uh, yeah. So I, yeah, that's my, my start. Yeah. <laughs> but, what, but what do you think is the responsibility of politics in this? I mean, mm -hmm. because uh, it's quite hard, uh, as Tuli uh, mentioned, I mean, to actually hold the highest power accountable. Yeah. How do you think, I mean... You have to become the highest power. You have to aspire to replace uh, the highest power. Political parties are, are really, I mean, on election day, you cannot vote for an NGO. You cannot vote for them. You have to, you, you, polit politicians are the problem, but we can't live without them. So we have to then, if we think that I am an unproblematic person, then you have to enter politics. It's the only way. So political parties, they aggregate the demands of a lot of people. Uh, they articulate plans, and if they have an ideology, they will be pre predictable. So if you vote for them, you can expect a certain outcome and a certain behavior in, 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 uh, in Parliament when it comes to legislation. If, you, if, if, if they don't follow what they have said, you will not vote for them the next time. So, and a reliable party over time will gain more and more support. Um, political parties prepare the office holders, both by training, but also by holding different positions within the party. So if the party is a membership-based democratic party, they will elect a local chairman for the party. If he shows, he or she shows to have good judgment, good character, they will elevate the person to the next level, to the regional branch and to the Congress, and maybe to be part of the party board or even become the party leader. But in a democratic organization, you will filter through and get the right kind of politicians in office. So I think it's very important not only for other people to invest in political parties, but for each one of us to consider it a civic responsibility to actually be a part of politics. So become the power, says Martin. <laughs> what do you say, Tuli, on this? Well, I absolutely agree uh, with Martin. And absolutely, uh, it's, it's an area that we overlook investing in democracy. Uh, the the Tuma Foundation that I have started together with my colleagues and uh, uh, some members of my family focuses on democracy, leadership, empowerment. And because I saw that area, that until we, we, we make sure that communities are fully engaged on the democratic processes, and I liked it when you said that uh, democracy is a threat to corruption. And that is when we have true democracy is original, was originally conceived. And part of the problem today, corruption thrives, is because our people think that their engagement with democracy ends at the ballot box, and the only recourse they have is to wait for another four years or another five years, and then to, to then do something. Whereas democracy is a constant engagement between public representatives and the people. And of course, when all else fails, the people who believe in a particular way of leading society should be the leaders they would like to see. And again, in, in, in the foundation, we're doing that. We have a module that we're using to train leaders. It is called an epic leadership training. We train leaders that are ethical, purpose-driven, impact conscious, and committed to serve. Because based on those three things, again, it, all of this comes from my experience in law reform and, and as a public protector, that a lot of it has to do with the fact that people are not, sometimes people don't even know what's the right thing. So the ethical leadership training would tell people, wait, how do we define what's right? And in South Africa, of course, the starting point should be the Constitution and, of course, relevant international law. And then other just uh, uh, considerations of decency, fairness, and, and justice. And then you have to look at sometimes leaders, apart from ethics, they lose a sense of purpose. Corruption takes over because your colleagues can't even call you to order because there's no sense of where's the boss going. Mm -hmm. Sometimes also there's no sense of what's the impact of what we're trying to do. What's the link between what I say as a leader and how I want people to behave? Because people are influenced not only by what you tell them to do, 
but people are influenced by what you do as a leader, and then they go in that direction. For example, former President Nelson Mandela did not just influence people because of the laws that were passed in the Constitution. It was what he consistently said about who we are as a society and what we should value and what we should reject as a society. And it was also about what he constantly did himself as part of the leadership of that society. And also, just lastly, the issue of leaders who put service first. And obviously, then your colleagues also are going to measure you when you start deviating because you're being corrupted, they would still look at what is needed in service for our people. If people need roads, if people need hospital equipment, is it proper that you run to Huawei and buy tablets just because you're gonna get a big tender and uh, end the process, there might be kickbacks. And in corruption, Martin, some of the corruption is not a bribe to me. Some of the corruption is I get a tender and the, the kickback gets paid as a donation to my political party. Mm -hmm. And what do I get as gratification from it is that I then become elevated in my party because I'm a rainmaker. Thank you. I, I need to still ask about this because, uh, as you said, you said, well, uh, then you, it, you, you might become corrupt on the way because you lose sense of purpose. And there is actually a famous quote, uh, ambition seduces and power corrupts. I don't know if you heard this. It's mm -hmm. from a movie. I, I want to ask about you all about that. Do you think it's true? Does power corrupt? On one hand, we should become the person with power, but does power corrupt? How do we handle this? Does anybody have any thoughts? I disagree that power corrupts. I think Lord Ayrton said, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power tends to corrupt absolute. The problem, Hannah, is that when we say power corrupts, we're allowing the corrupt to say they're part of a normal way of life. That when we say, for example, corrupt politicians are corrupt, we are allowing the corrupt ones to believe that they're part of a normal system. There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. It's what is expected. And I, I, I served with two politicians, Dalla Omar and Bridget Mabandla. I can vouch for them that there wasn't a single corrupt bone in those politicians' bones, bodies. And I'm certain that in Sweden here, much as you may have small cases of corruption, but there are people that you can vouch for and say, this one is neither corrupt nor corruptible. Um, we have, as you said, small uh, pieces of corruption also here in Sweden. I actually <laughs> wanted to ask about that because we have had some, quite some scandals in Sweden. Um, we had, uh, well, uh, Telia Sonera and its conduct in Azerbaijan. Um, and I wanted to ask, is Swedish anti-corruption work sufficient? What do you say? Well, primarily, of course, uh, Morten, perhaps. And Martin, I mean, you... Is it sufficient? Do we do enough in Sweden against this? It, it is not. And, and uh, we, we are working, of course, in, in, in other countries. And uh, we were going to have a seminar on, on corruption in Belarus. And then we said, well, when they were building that stadium in, in Solna, uh, they had lots of, I mean, real corruption scandal. Then uh, the, all the people who were involved died, uh, not mysteriously, but they died before they could take them to court. But this was clear cases of, of corruption. Uh, and we tried to get the, the people from the local city council, because we're politically connected, both we and we did this together with the Social Democrats. We tried to get anybody to come and speak to us about what had really happened. Uh, but they don't. They, nobody wanted to come and talk about it. So people really, really want to sweep it under the, the carpet. The problem in Sweden is that there is a, there is a sense that there could be no corruption. So, so there is a lot of, of meeting places, which is very good in Sweden. We can meet like this and, and we can mix business and, and, and civil servants and politicians and we have a dialogue. It's a consensus-oriented society. 
but through these, some of these networks, actually people start making favors. In the, in the beginning, they think it's, this is a fast way of doing things. The, the, the politicians in Solna are proud to have a big stadium there, and oh, now we can get it done, and this guy is so nice. And they start bending the rules a little bit. And I don't think it's mainly for personal gain in the first place, but it, it's a non-good governance system of running thing. It's a non-procurement thing. And it's not only in the, in the building sector. I, I would say even that in, in development aid, uh, you leave uh, a lot of, um, if you compare Swedish aid with the European aid, you, European aid has had a lot of scandals. So they have much tighter pr procurement systems and support systems and grant making systems than Sweden has because Sweden is a little bit inso uh, innocent. And again, it's not people stealing money, but uh, but the, the people of Sweden are not getting the optimal stadiums, the optimal health care perhaps, the op optimal uh, development aid projects because we leave too much responsibility to the whims of the individual uh, decision maker. But, yeah. No, just on, on these two elements, uh, I, I think first we have to recognize that uh, until uh, let's say 15 years ago, uh, I'm not quite certain on the exact date in, in Sweden, but in the Nordic countries, you could actually deduct a bribe from your tax bill if you were working abroad. So that was sort of the culture we came from, that it was accepted. Of course, not when it happened in, in Sweden or in Denmark, course. but when it was abroad. So it, it was, in a way, semi-recognized as a, a work ethics. That was then changed uh, some 10, 15 years ago in, in most of the, the, if not all of the, the Nordic countries. So that's one element. And then the other element is what, what you point to and where I see an interesting movement, and that is that an organization like Sala SQL uh, are now working very much with the municipalities and uh, local and regional authorities on, the, uh, on corruption at the local level. Uh, and regional level in Sweden, and what they say is that it's it's pressuring, it's pressuring, it's constantly they have to be on uh, on their toes in order to to put the uh, their foot down and and develop new approaches to uh, and and penetrate what are the the flows and the, the structures. So, so on the one hand, it it has been in our culture and in in sort of the the business ethics in one way. And at the same time, there is a bottom-up uh, acknowledgement that we need to look into it. So, I mean, we can foster uh, ethical leaders, right, uh, within political parties, like you mm. said. But I also think about, okay, now we have, it, we have three lawyers here. So, of course, I want to say, isn't this a legal yeah. issue? I mean, I have to ask that. Can we fight this with legislation? As, as we, I said, we... Uh, no, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Well, in South Africa, I have suggested, Hannah, that we should uh, fight some of it with legislation. And starting with ethics, I don't know in Sweden, I didn't check if you have a code of ethics that is generic or transversal, covers every state employee. In the US, they do have that one. In South Africa, we have codes of ethics for each group. So there's one for the members of the executive, there's a different one for municipal people, public protector, you create your own code. At the end of the day, some codes are too limited. For example, in corruption, one of the areas that creates corruption is conflict of interest and unmanaged conflict of interest. That whole thing of you know, having your friends, your friend's daughter needs a job or your friend's daughter needs a contract, somebody from your church needs a contract or something like that. If you don't manage those things, it can lead to corruption. Not in the payment of bribes, but abuse of entrusted power for personal gain. You might gain a friendship, you might gain a family, a affirmative, you, know, you might gain um, a, a better position in church, but it's still corruption. The best thing then is to have one code of ethics. Whilst you, you must have sector ones, like one for the doctors, etc. but there should be one where wrong is wrong and it is defined. And, and that was my experience was that the debate ended up being about the powers of the pub protector, whereas the debate should have been about was it right for the president to do nothing when a quarter of a million rands was being spent. 
to pay for a swimming pool, a, ke a kettle crawl, and things like that in the name of security. So that was an ethical question. That was a question of abuse of state power for personal gain. But just I wanted to go back to the issue that you raised about power seducing. I don't want to come across it as, as denying the fact that there's some truth though in that statement, that power, if for example, you, your ethics are low, when you have power, you are even more challenged because you exercise entrusted power in private spaces and the people who have given you that power don't get to know what you are doing in their name. And there's a, a higher temptation to favor yourself and or to favor those who are close to you. And it is true, I think the Chief Justice talks about what you said about power being seductive that sometimes people become corrupt. I've seen people who are becoming corrupt, not because they love money, because they love political office. Mm -hmm. So money is a means to stay in power because with the money they accumulate, they will buy votes and stay in office. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, first, as I said before, it's... Uh, uh, we, we need to have a popular understanding of this. We need to work much more on that, and that's sort of outside the legal uh, scope. And then we need to devise a number of, of strategies throughout the different sectors. Next week in Lund, we are convening an international roundtable on exactly this, and, and some of the things that I know that will be discussed is, for example, that Maersk, the big uh, transport company, yeah. Uh, will be there to present some of their training and some of their methodology on how they actually equip their staff to resist uh, the uh, corruption that they meet when they enter this or that harbor. I mean, you have cases where, again, a ship, one of Maersk's ships is uh, outside uh, a country waiting to enter full of medicine. And, and they have a zero uh, corruption policy, and they say, sorry, we're not paying, uh, paying you to uh, unload on this medicine. And they say, okay, but then you cannot get in. Wow. Uh, and at the same time, people are dying from a particular disease or whatever, uh, who, those people who need that particular medicine. So again, a very clear link. And there they have developed some extremely interesting strategies. We will also, a Swedish IT company has developed an app uh, where you can actually at a low level report uh, corruption when you meet it and then aggregate the knowledge in a way and thereby prepare mm -hmm. cases if that's what you want or you want to stigmatize, you can highlight it in, in public. Finally, we will also hear about some uh, NGO networks uh, sort of teaming up and systema uh, in a systematic manner map sort of say, where do the social allowances, for example, to persons with disabilities, uh, where do they end up? Do these people actually get their, their uh, social allowances? And the answer is no. And that aggregate up to billions. I mean, really big amounts. And in that particular case that we will hear about uh, next week, uh, I mean, two ministers had to step down and there are now some severe cases running uh, against them, all from a very network NGO, uh, attempts or, or work. So, so there are a number of these strategies that need to get much more traction, they need to be better known and, and receive support. So in a way I'm, I'm hopeful that we can address it. And if I can just sort of think, make a parallel to why I'm hopeful, uh, because if you go back 25 years, when we looked at, uh, at torture back 25 years ago, it was sort of generally recognized it was sort of a normality, like I would claim corruption is today. Today, after 25 years of hard work in the human rights environment, everybody knows, the police, most people in the world, uh, the authorities know that to torture is wrong. It still takes place, maybe not as much as it did. So I think it has helped somewhat, but at least there is an awareness that this is wrong. And that is the first step. Without that awareness, we won't move much. So, could I ask two things? So, I'm hopeful. Yeah, so that's I'm my happy. Point. <laughs> I'm happy. We're, we're yeah. You're hopeful. And uh, I'm going to let you in just in a second, Martin, because I want to just ask, because you, you mentioned a private company. So, um, 
I'm also interested, is there a difference how you have to approach this when you look at it within public office and if, when you look at it within the private sector? And secondly, how important is different system for whistleblowing? So I, these two questions, I want to feed them in because, um, I mean, knowing about what's happening, for example, in a cargo, you need somebody actually telling you about this, that, that somebody's actually paying the price. So whistleblowing systems and is there a difference between the private uh, sector and, uh, and politics? So I will let you in now if you have. Yeah, no, it, it, because you say among lawyers, can we legislate? Yeah, yeah. And I'm not a lawyer, I'm a, uh, and I'm liberal. We believe in the rule of law, but, but we're liberal. So maybe uh, uh, sometimes, actually, if you take away regulation, you also take away a lot of opportunities for corruption. And in the, the case of your example, if you have free trade between, between two countries, there is no customs official standing in the way making life difficult for you. Uh, the same when it comes to, to welfare systems, if they're conditioned, then there's somebody making a decision and it's sensitive to com corruption. If they are generalized uh, and automatic, then, then there is not room for corruption. So I think a lot of, of deregulation actually rather than regulation is what, what takes away some of the problems of corruption. So free trade, free that's trade the way. Free trade and uh, free societies, <laughs> neoliberalism. Okay. <laughs> no, and, but, but is there, I mean, uh, free trade, private companies, I mean, how do you work with this? Could you work with it? Do you work with it in the same way when it comes to private companies as in public offices? What, what, uh, you have a, uh, what's your experience, Julie? Well, firstly, I would agree with um, Martin that some regulations are better removed to to reduce uh, corruption because just giving people the power to decide yes or no increases opportunities for corruption. But for me, it's not so much changing the law. I think transparency. I think transparency internationally is on to something about making sure that the average citizen knows what their rights are. And that's why the linking of human rights and corruption is a perfect idea. If the citizen knows exactly what their rights are, they will be less willing to pay bribes, but they would also know when they're being made to feel they don't deserve it, because it will be there. In, in South Africa, for example, at social grants in South Africa, when we started, there were a lot of pro problems around uh, uh, bribes in, in the payment of social grants for children, older persons, etc. And one of the things, we, we did a systemic investigation where you look at the whole system and then you recommend what they could do. One of the things that we asked them to do was, in all of their offices, they had to put specific requirements and to say, if you're coming to this office, you need a birth certificate, you need this, you need that, etc. So that there's no opportunity for people to ask for things that are not there. Because people kept being sent back. And then to prevent yourself from being sent back, then you might as well then uh, put in your ID a, 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 a bit of money. There's a World Bank professor that has created a formula for corruption. I think it's Professor Klitgaard. The formula is C equals D minus A. And that is corruption it is equal, corruption e equals unfettered discretion minus accountability. So you do need to limit discretion. And I think we can leverage technology mm -hmm. to reduce discretion. When uh, some South African students at Harvard who are doing IT have said that if a lot of it is just about pressing a button, yes or no, yes or no, there's no human involvement, and you just limit the space where people have to say, yes, you can get it. You know. So you, you're looking for a mining license. There's a lot of corruption in South Africa in that space. But if a lot of it is just openly done, and then there's a system that measures what you, what you brought in the system, that would decrease corruption. But mm. it sounds like you're talking about accountability, you're talking about transparency. Yeah. That sounds like a right-based approach. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. So, so that's, that's how you uh, <laughs> put it together with human rights. So, yeah. It is. It proves it again. Human rights. So but but quite, whistle quite, lower, but Let yeah. me just also mm. come back to your question uh, on uh, sort of the different approaches. I think overall there's a general approach as, as you write the outline. Mm. I mean, with transparency, uh, 
uh, transparency, uh, accountability mechanisms. And that goes both for the public and the private sector. But then when you go further down, then you have to start devising your, your, sort of say, your separate strategies. Mm -hmm. And again, if you are, let's say, in the business sector, are you in the shipping, are you in the tele, uh, tele company or, or whatever area you're working in, you are confronted with different uh, let's say challenges uh, in that regard. You meet the corrupt or the possibility of corruption in, in different areas and you sort of say devise your, your, your strategies accordingly, civil society uh, and so forth, the health sector and so forth. So, so and I think it's again that awareness, getting it from the different, for example, the shipping companies. I know they're now working closer together to see how can we exchange some of these strategies and methodologies. And, uh, and it's that sort of collaboration that needs to be strengthened. Just a small contribution, Hannah. We also need to bring in the UN Global Compact, just to add to what Morten has said. Because mm. there, the business people are devising strategies uh, as part of the 10 principles of the UN Global Compact. And one of the 10 principles is implementation of the UN um, the Convention Against Corruption. And one of the emerging dialogues or conversations around corruption has been the question of self-disclosure, where companies have been part of corruption, being the ones coming forth and say, I paid a bribe, or I did this, I thought I deserved it, but without paying a bribe, I would not make it, and, um, and, and then be given immunity because they've self-disclosed, but then, uh, then being asked to be their peer educators to make sure that other companies don't do what they did. And, and follow up on that one, I think we, we need to also devise uh, much better structures to protect the whistleblowers, Absolutely. the people working, and as yeah. you, you said, the, all the yeah. threats that you had received, and I definitely recognize that from, from my own world. I mean, the number of human rights defenders that have moved into this area, I mean, had to flee, had to seek protection, or eventually was uh, severely harmed. So it's really an area where you can, I would almost say, you, you touch so profound structures in society, and there's so much at risk for those that you touch that, uh, that we need to, if we want to succeed in this, we also need to think on the side and the protection of those who enter into that minefield because it is really very explosive. And it can be uh, on a personal level also very hard when you actually have to face the ultimate power and actually question it when it is corrupt. So I would like to actually, because we are running a little bit out of time, so I'm gonna end up with, I would like to get from all of you your best advice on fighting corruption. I mean, what should we, everybody here, there's a lot of people, so what can you do on a personal level and what should you do on a structural level? If we, you would give us some advice, what should we do? The, the first one is, uh, on a very personal level, say no, wherever you are, also in the train in Poland. Yes, <laughs> I told my friend, <laughs> she will never do it again. <laughs> no, and, and then uh, we need to start the dialogue, uh, a stronger uh, dialogue on this, widen the dialogue. Of course, we have talked corruption, but I would say in a fairly uh, narrow field, we need to widen it and uh, get more actors on board so it becomes a more popular movement than what it has been uh, so far. Again, I firmly believe the only way is if we get a bottom-up uh, approach to this. Okay. Right. I would say, for me, uh, I agree with the idea that, uh, let's say corruption stops with me. It stops with us. Because I think 50% of the problem is solved when each person who has been to a conference on corruption makes a personal determination that they will never be involved in corruption, even if it means bribing a traffic cop. I can sit here and honestly say I've never bribed a, 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 a traffic cop, and my kids who drove with me most of the time when they're small, they can confirm that, but they said, but, some, but sometimes I, I, I sort of begged, so that's almost like bribery. So. But just don't pay a bribe under any circumstances. But secondly, 
Let's educate others about the link between their day-to-day -day lives and corruption. Because if people are not making the link between their own lives, their own personal struggles on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not going to care about that area. And yet it does distort justice. It, does, it can kill bridges, buses, things that are allowed to go through, uh, uh, through corruption when they are not properly done. And ultimately, it creates an uneven playing field. So there's something in it for people. But just lastly, for me, what I would say, let's also deal with transnational crime. I asked colleagues here if they knew about a scandal that is brewing involving a Canadian company called Bombardier. Mm. And I was told that there is something brewing in Sweden about the same company. And in South Africa, um, uh, that company crossed my radar when I was investigating the how train uh, tender. Transnational crime is, corruption is usually transnational. All of the big cases that I in, investigated in South Africa involve international companies. And therefore, let's make sure that even if it didn't happen in our own country, if we have information that we can supply to the country that is affected by corruption, let's let's assist, and where profits have been um, siphoned out of poor democracies into rich countries, let's repatriate those profits back to the countries where the money has been stolen. Thank you. And Very final. quickly, don't fight corruption, build democracy, build transparency, wow. protect elections, protect the freedom of speech and the freedom of assembly, hold governments to account. We have heard people saying, drain the swamp, uh, like Donald Trump coming into Washington and being more corrupt than any president has ever been. Uh, Lukashenko in, in Belarus went on an election platform of fighting corruption. I am the tough guy who can fight corruption. Let's not get, give in to that kind of bad apple theory and let's instead focus on building the institutions and, and, and protecting the human rights that are pre prerequisite for actually safeguarding a rule of law state. So let's build democracy. Let's have that as final words. Thank you so much for this panel.